Hello and welcome back. In this video, we'll be looking at buffer overflows. Okay. Um, so buffer overflows are typically an attack that applies to programming languages that do not uh, provide any boundary checks. So that means uh, one, when it starts to write um, data onto the memory, if it does not provide a boundary check, it, the memory, uh, well, the allocated space can be overwritten and flows onto the next bits of the memory. And if you carefully craft this, you can use it uh, to actually gain access um, to the target systems. Okay, so let's have a look at what buffer flow is and how it works. Um, in a nutshell, our software programs are not monolithic. So that means it's going to have a lot of different components associated with and provides that complex relationship between modules, libraries, and functions. Okay. Uh, one module calls the another module, which may call another module, etc. So it's not monolithic. Okay. Uh, control is transferred from one module to another. So for example, for main module, you might get a get input module and then process input module and then display output module and so forth. Okay. So you are jumping from one function to the other or one module to the other and then um, the control is passed on to that module that needs to process that. Okay, so the issue here is how to maintain the state of temporarily suspended modules. Okay, so that was uh, this is the computing stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The solution is the system stack. Okay. So you probably know and understand what stack is, right? So things get stuck, and uh, the last one in comes first out, right? So in memory. A layout uh, the stack looks like this so in computer memory it has both stacks and queues um, we are only looking at the stack aspects okay when the program gets run, uh, run uh, it uses the stack okay so the stack refers to the memory space available to the program to store information during execution okay so this is a, um, a real-time stuff um, okay so in that stack it's going to store things like the variables uh, return addresses, uh, etc. Okay, and the main program uh, calls other routines, uh, user-defined routines or like functions. Okay, uh, as well as the system library routines like math, input, output, etc. The main program has a block of information on the stack. So wh when you run a main program, it's going to add the main program into the stack. But when the main program calls some other stuff, like other routines, it's going to add the other stuff on top of the main and so forth, right? So it knows how to get back to where it started from, okay? So when a call is made to another module, the block of information for the module goes onto the stack um, with all those information, so it knows how to get back to where it was last time. The process may be continued for many modules, um, uh, like a bunch of modules gets called on and all of them goes into the stack um, and as well as uh, calling the module that has been called before. So you can think about the recursive functions. It's going to call itself over and over again. The way it keeps track of what the state it was is using the stack, right? So this is possible to keep track of um, as long as we have space. But we have to note that the stack contains a finite amount of space. And typically in your laptop right now, the maximum size you can get is about, no. Typically people use about eight to 16 gigabytes of RAM, right? So that's where the space we're talking about. And your operating system probably occupy quite a lot of that right now. And you probably have some other stuff running. So they're also occupying those spaces. So now we need to understand a bit more about arrays and buffers. So buffer is a general category of storage structure that holds some data, whereas array, a, we typically refer it to a homogeneous structure holding multiple instances of one data type. So uh, integers or floats or characters, so forth, right? Okay, so now let's have a look at some simple example. We have a series of characters C of size four. So this particular array will hold uh, the characters, four characters, okay? And C copies another string S, assumes it is declared, right? Using string copy function. So we have um, 
char c4. So now we have four spaces to store characters. And then we copy um, s into c. And then we can print um, some other stuff like i that we declared earlier, right? So we can do stuff like that. Okay, it's very simple code. Okay, um, but as mentioned before, buffer flow happens because you don't do boundary checks, right? So what happens if array has 10 elements, uh, can write 11 values into array? Well, the value is written into adjoining memory location. So that means if I have more things to copy into a smaller area, and because these functions don't provide boundary checks, I'm just going to overwrite the uh, adjoining memory spaces. Okay? So if you own that memory space, you, you can overwrite the, the value that has been stored in there. Otherwise, um, well, usually, so usually that's not good, okay? because you are overwriting your data value. Okay? And if you don't own that memory location, the system will flag an error, and usually this causes a sec fault. Okay, so now back to the example. So we're going to do that. So what, what happens if S had a value A, B, C, D, E, F? Okay, so remembering the previous um, explanation, uh, let's follow through. Okay, the short I gets put into stack. And remember, short is two bytes. And then now we have character C4 staying in the stack. String copy C from S, and S contains six bytes, right? Six hex values. So four of them gets filled, and two of them gets overwritten to short I. So the value of I will be overwritten with values EF. So EF gets overwritten in there. And to understand this further, we will draw the stack diagram soon as well. Okay, so now, now we understand the vulnerability uh, so we can do stuff with it, okay? Uh, compiler does not check whether the program is writing within specific array. So compiler is not uh, in charge of that, okay? C language provides many routines that do not check array limits, okay? And there's tons of it. Uh, I have an example here, okay? Um, okay, uh, but some of the uh, uh, ones that are commonly used is the string copy and string cat, okay? Which is copying the source to destination and concatenating source onto destination, okay? So all of those do not provide boundary checks. So if you see any of those guys, you can um, plan your buffer flow attacks, okay? All right, so now we understand how these buffers can be overwritten onto the next um, available memory space. We can craft our attacks. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can start the attack. The exploit steps are like this. If the buffer overflows occur accidentally, okay, so that means it's just a bad memory uh, mem management, the program will throw a sec fault, as we expected before. But we can exploit this fact and do something more malicious, right? So if the program was given an input carefully directed to overrun the return address by manipulating the stack, Arbitrary code may be injected. So when we say arbitrary code, it literally means you can try to run anything you want, okay? as long as uh, the memory space is large enough. Okay? And what pe people typically do is try to get the shell. Okay? So because once you get the shell, you can do anything that, you, that the user is able to do. Okay? So write a small program that starts a shell window. That's what people do. Yeah. We always talk about shell. Anyway. Um, Something like um, slash bin slash sh. That's where the, sh uh, the shell command gets stored in, okay? Um, just like the remote shell attacks, okay? So translate the program into machine code. That's what we need to do because when you compile it, that gets compiled into machine code. Um, um, you can do this by modifying individual bytes as needed. So when you do your buffer flow lab, uh, you will be introduced into creating a machine code uh, using different libraries. Okay? Uh, write the machine code into a buffer, uh, followed by the address of the start of that buffer. Okay? And you can repeat this uh, many times. We'll see why. Okay? And then we'll override the return address of the service buffer handler routine. So that means um, in the stack, 
At some stage, there's a return address. Return address is needed so that the stack knows how to get back to the previous state. Okay, but if you can override by overflowing your buffer and redirecting it to your code, then you can execute your code. Okay, so that's the uh, nutshell. Um, so to do this, we need to get a copy of the OS uh, to be attacked. Why? Because we need to understand how the memory is laid out and where uh, different bits and pieces are stored. Okay. Analyze the system stack layer for, the, for that operating system and hardware platform. Uh, and then put the shell window machine code into a buffer. Okay. Uh, send your buffer to a program uh, on the target operating system. Uh, maybe one that runs as root. Okay. And that takes a buffer as input. Uh, make a copy of the buffer and don't check its bound. Okay. So easily put, uh, first couple of steps, understand the environment you are targeting. Third step, create the shell code, uh, um, machine code, uh, and then put it into a buffer. Okay, you prepare a file to be read by the buffer, and then you send the buffer to the program to make it read it, and then it's going to do it for you. Okay, all right, so let's have a look at the example. This should make it much more clear, hopefully. Okay, so this is the stack. Okay, the stack grows up. Okay, and on this side, up, up, up there, the up there, the code is an example code. And as you can see, um, it has two functions to demonstrate how the stacks, uh, the layout of the stack changes. So let's start uh, from the main. Okay, so if we start from the main, what we have is a base pointer, um, and then we have a stack pointer. Okay, we we chuck A in there. And then we chuck B, and then we are up to where the red arrow is. Okay, so if we go further, what we need to do is um, we're calling foo, function foo. That means I need to reserve some space, uh, memory for second argument, memory for the first argument. Okay, so now we are chucking stuff about the foo, and because we are moving on to another function we need to be able to return back to the main, right? So that's when the foo gets finished, okay? So what we're going to do is add some additional information such that we can go back to our main function later. So here's the change. So prior value of base pointer gets added into the stack and we also have the correct return address, okay? So those, um, those two lines, uh, the BP uh, value and the return address, is going to set back where the BP should go back to and where the SP should be going back to. So SP is just the current state. So BP can go back to where it was before, okay? And at this point, now we have added a uh, cha junks into the memory, okay? So in the full function, we assume it takes input from the user to assign junks variable, okay? So that's just the assumption and it's going to do some more stuff, right? So if the input uh, is within seven bytes, that's how we uh, expect the function to run, the program will run as normal, okay? Uh, but the user can also allocate more than seven bytes for the variable junk, okay? Because there is no boundary checks. For example, input provided was some long sequence of bytes, okay? Well, what happens now? As we've seen with the, the smaller code example, what happens is, you fill up the seven uh, bytes in junk, uh, but additional bytes gets overwritten over uh, whatever was below the stack, okay? So stuff gets written onto the prior BP point, the return address, and everything. Depends on how much you write. And if this goes over the bottom and starts moving on to other programs area, then it's, it's going to sag fault. So what happens when foo function finishes? Well, if the return address is overwritten with some other hex values or other bytes, then the instruction pointer will probably jump onto some random address, okay? Because that particular uh, junk probably points to somewhere else, okay? And this will likely to cause a sec fault because in your current program, you're probably trying to access somewhere 
that uh, you, you cannot have access to or has some junks in it. Okay? So if these series of events are caused on purpose, it is called a buffer flaw tag. Okay? Um, but it does have some few other names like stack smashing. So let's have a look. So from here, imagine the junk contains some executable code instead. So that's when we were talking about creating a machine code for uh, accessing the shell. So the top part is the executable code and below we're going to fill some uh, random junks. Okay? And eventually we're going to put a new return address that's going to point back to our executable code. Okay? So that means when it goes to uh, where it's supposed to return, the return address value, if we map it nicely on top of that, then it's going to go back top. So if you know exactly where the return address is supposed to be, then you can craft your buffer flow tag. Okay? However, uh, that is not always the case, right? So sometimes you will uh, write the return address uh, multiple times. So here you are guessing uh, where, the ex uh, where the return address may be if you don't have a full picture of the vulnerable program. Okay? So sometimes the return address can be guessed. So, how do we prevent buffer flaws? Well, basically, you probably don't want to use any suspected C or C++ routines. And C and C++ are probably most widely used language in the past, such that much of the legacy code are still written in C and C++, as well as um, Python. If you think about Python, uh, the underlying code that used to write Python is C. Okay? So C is still everywhere, and therefore, we don't know where this buffer of flaws may rise again. And bad practice of writing C code still exists and therefore buffer of flow can still occur. Okay? Um, so alternatively, we can use some new routines that check boundaries. So string n copy that checks the boundaries. Um, and alternatively, just use safe programming languages. So those languages including Java, Python, which have a automatically built in a boundary checks. Okay. Um, of course, there are still applications that are better written in C or C++. That's why we cannot just move away from them. Okay. So when we do so, we should, we should also check the legacy code for buffer vulnerabilities. So remember, um, when you write a function, it's not monolithic. You're going to be likely be using some libraries and other people's code and make sure those are safe as well. Okay. And check for programmer use of suspected routines, use of code libraries, use of code library that uses code libraries and so forth. Okay. And further to that, we can use um, additional security controls like using the latest security controls, uh, protocols, um, policies, etc using the uh, DEP, the non-executable stack. So making the stack non-executable, we can't execute any code there, uh, as well as address space layer randomization, um, which you will all practice using uh, in the labs. Okay. Uh, so as mentioned before, uh, the policy can also prevent uh, buffer flow attacks from happening by constraining how you interact with the program but I'll let you read this part. Okay, and of course there are many tools that allows you to uh, make buffer flow more automated rather than writing from scratch. Um, so here's a few other items, but uh, in the labs you explore some of those. So I'll leave you to that. Otherwise, we'll finish here um, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.